So what's the induction step? We need to prove that E of n is less than or equal to C times n. So let's start from the left hand side. Let's start from T of n. T of n is equal to T of the floor of n by 2 plus T of the ceiling of n by 2 plus 1. We are given this in the definition of the recurrence itself. Now we can apply the induction hypothesis to substitute these two terms by their corresponding right hand sides in the claim. So we can substitute, we can use the induction hypothesis to assume that T of the floor of n by 2 is less than or equal to C times the floor of n by 2 and we can also assume that T of the ceiling of n by 2 is less than or equal to C times the ceiling of n by 2. Why do these assumptions hold? Well, they will hold assuming that the arguments here, the floor of n by 2 and the ceiling of n by 2 fall into this range from 1 to n minus 1. That is both these terms, the floor of n by 2 and the ceiling of n by 2 need to be greater than or equal to 1 and they can at most go up to n minus 1. Now this will be true for all values of n greater than or equal to 2. You can verify that easily. Both these will be less than n. That's pretty easy to show for values of n greater than or equal to 2. And they will also be greater than or equal to 1. So assuming the induction hypothesis and assuming that we are looking at values of n greater than or equal to 2, we can replace these two terms by their corresponding right hand sides. Now if the value of n had been less than 2, we would need to show that the claim holds there separately and we have already done that in our base case where we proved t of 1 separately. So, we have t of n is this expression and by replacing these two terms by their corresponding right hand sides in the induction hypothesis, we will be increasing the value of this expression on the right hand side. So, we will get t of the floor of n by 2 is less than or equal to c times the floor of n by 2 and t of the ceiling of n by 2 is less than or equal to c times the ceiling of n by 2. So by substituting these two terms, again remember that we are using the substitution method here. So by substituting these two terms in place of these two terms, we will get t of n is less than or equal to c times the floor of n by 2 plus c times the ceiling of n by 2 plus 1. We can take c common over here and inside the brackets we will be left with the floor of n by 2 plus the ceiling of n by 2 and outside the brackets we have this plus 1. Now the floor of n by 2 plus the ceiling of n by 2 is nothing but n. Why is that? Why is the floor of n by 2 plus the ceiling of n by 2 equal to n? We can prove this pretty easily. Let's take two possibilities. Either n is even or n is odd. If n is even, then n divided by 2 is a whole number. So if n divided by 2 is a whole number, whether we take the floor of that number or the ceiling of that number, we are just going to get that number itself. So the left hand side in that case will be just n by 2 plus n by 2 which is equal to n and this is the right hand side. So clearly this holds when n is even. What if n is odd? If n is odd then we can write n as some 2m plus 1 for, for some 
non negative value of m so writing n is 2m plus 1 the left hand side will be the floor of 2m plus 1 by 2 plus the ceiling of uh, 2m plus 1 by 2 substituting n equal to 2m plus 1 here now this can be simplified to m plus 0.5 with the floor operator here and with the ceiling operator over here now what is the floor of m plus 0.5 well, m is some non-negative integer. So, m plus 0.5 is going to be some fraction where uh, it's, it's going to be some fraction of the form m.5. You know, assuming that m is an integer. For example, if m is, uh, say, 5, m plus 0.5 is going to be 5.5. So, if you take the floor of m.5 or m plus 0.5, we're going to get m because the floor of any number is the largest integer less than or equal to that number. And if we take the ceiling of m plus 0.5 or m.5, we are going to get the smallest integer larger than this number. So we have to move to the next higher integer, which is m plus 1. So the left hand side here becomes m plus m plus 1, which is 2m plus 1. And 2m plus 1 is nothing but n. So we can write this as n. And so we get the right hand side over here. So even if n is odd, the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. And so whether n is even or whether n is odd, we can write the floor of n by 2 plus the ceiling of n by 2 as n. So here, in the induction step, we have now proven that t of n is less than or equal to c times n plus 1. This is what we have proven so far. But what did we set out to prove? We wanted to prove that t of n is less than or equal to c times n. This is what we wanted to prove. But we ended up proving that t of n is less than or equal to cn plus 1. Now, if t of n is less than or equal to cn plus 1, it does not necessarily, imp necessarily imply that t of n is less than or equal to c times n. So, we need to prove something slightly stronger than what we have proven. And by following this inductive proof, we have ended up not being able to prove the exact statement that we set out to prove we've ended up proving something slightly different, slightly looser than the relatively stronger claim that we wanted to prove. Now, this can mean either two things. The first possibility is that maybe this claim is not true for all n, which is why we were not able to prove it using induction. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that maybe instead of trying to prove that t of n is less than or equal to c times n, we should have tried to prove something slightly stronger. Let's say we, let's say instead of trying to prove that t of n is less than or equal to c times n, let's modify this claim and say that we're going to try to prove t of n is less than or equal to c times n minus a lower order term, which is b. So we are subtracting a lower order term over here and we are saying that instead of trying to prove this claim, let's try now to prove this claim. Now this may sound a little counterintuitive at first because if we did not succeed at proving that t of n is less than or equal to c times n, we are now trying to prove something even stronger that t of n is less than or equal to c times n minus b. Again, like, like c, b is also some positive constant here. So shouldn't we be uh, shouldn't we modify it to t of n is less than or equal to cn plus b instead of minus b? Why did we modify it to minus b? Well, the answer is 
intuitive if you see the if you look at the form of this expression when we substitute these two terms by the right hand sides of their induction inductive hypothesis if we had a plus b over here that plus b would have gotten added twice right when we try to prove when we try to prove the induction step now using the modified claim for t of n instead of proving that t of n is less than or equal to cn we are now going to try to prove that t of n is less than or equal to cn minus b and in our induction hypothesis we would have a minus b here in both these inequalities if we had a plus b instead then we would have had a plus b here two times and then we would have ended up ended with 1 plus 2b we would have an extra 2b term over here so if we wanted to prove that t of n is less than or equal to cn plus b we would end up getting cn plus 1 plus 2b on the right hand side again we would miss proving what we wanted to prove right let me write this down if this was a little confusing let's say we had modified the modified our claim from this to t of n is less than or equal to c n plus b for some positive values of c and b that's one way we can modify this claim the other way we can modify this claim is we're going to try to prove that t of n is less than or equal to c n minus b if we change this claim to this then assuming that we you know we we, we end up proving the base case let's not worry about the base case here let's assume that the induction hypothesis holds for values of k from 1 to n minus 1 and again the claim here is t of k is less than or equal to c k plus b and we want to prove that t of n is less than or equal to c n plus b now in the induction step we are going to substitute these two terms by the right hand sides which are again going to have a plus b term so we are going to get two plus b terms on the right hand side here so we will get c common again and we'll end up with an n inside the bracket and we'll have plus 1 and plus 2b so we get t of n is less than or equal to cn plus b which is what this is what we wanted to prove that t of n is less than or equal to cn plus b but in addition to this we also get this b plus 1 term so again in the induction step we have ended up proving something slightly looser than what we wanted to be we, we've proven that t of n is less than or equal to this plus this and both these are uh, positive of course but we wanted to prove that t of n is less than or equal to just this term this expression by itself and that's not necessarily true if t of n is less than or equal to this plus this it does not necessarily imply that t of n is less than or equal to this expression by itself so again having this plus b doesn't help us so let's try the other alternative let's try modifying the claim to t of n is less than or equal to cn minus b now you may again think here that it's not going to help us but let's see how the induction step works now with this modification so we're going to work with the modified claim here Again, we'll return to the base case shortly. Let's just look at the induction step first. The induction hypothesis is going to be that the, the claim is true for all values of the argument less than n. That is, for values of the argument ranging from 1 to n minus 1. That is, for all these values of the argument, t of k is less than or equal to c times k minus b. And we need to prove that this claim holds at n assuming that it holds for values less than n so assuming that it holds at values less than n can be proved that it holds at n 
Well, let's see what t of n is. If we use the recurrence and then apply the induction hypothesis. So from the induction hypothesis, we get that these two terms must be less than or equal to, so t of the floor of n by 2 must be less than or equal to c times the floor of n by 2 minus b and t of the ceiling of n by 2 must be less than or equal to c times the ceiling of n by 2 minus b. Again, assuming that both these arguments fall within this range from 1 to n minus 1 and they will if n is greater than or equal to 2. So let's substitute these two terms by their right hand sides. So we'll get c times the floor of n by 2 minus b plus c times the floor of n by 2 minus b. Now remember what we were trying to prove here. We're trying to prove that t of n is less than or equal to cn minus b. By having this minus b term now, we are going to get again c times n over here when we combine, well, when we take c common in these two terms, we will get the floor of n by 2 plus the ceiling of n by 2 here, which will again become c times n. But notice what we get apart from that, we will get 2 minus b terms and we will have this plus 1. Now by subtracting b, subtracting a lower order term from this, uh, from c times n, we are going to end up subtracting this minus b term twice when we apply the induction hypothesis. This gives us a better shot at proving what we set out to prove because we just want to prove that t of n is less than or equal to c n minus b. But now we have a minus 2b term here. So hopefully we are going to get something we are going to get something uh, reasonable on the right hand side so that we will be able to show that t of n is less than or equal to c n minus b. So can we say that this expression c n plus 1 minus 2 b which is what we get on the right hand side over here, can we say that this expression is less than or equal to c n minus b? Well if yes then we would have proven by transitivity that t of n is less than or equal to c n minus b. Now because we have cn over here and we have a minus 2b term over here, we have a better chance now at proving this because this will be less than or equal to cn minus b assuming, so when will the left hand side here be less than or equal to the right hand side, well cn will cancel on both sides and a minus b will, can this minus b will cancel with one of these minus b terms. So we'll have 1 minus b less than or equal to 0 or b being greater than or equal to 1. So if our value of b is chosen to be greater than or equal to 1, then the right hand side here will be less than or equal to cn minus b. And we can see why because if the value of b is greater than or equal to 1, then we'll be subtracting b twice over here. One of these b terms will go into proving that t of n is less than or equal to c n minus b. So we need to have a minus b over here. The other minus b, because it's chosen to be greater than 1, will cancel out this plus 1. And in fact, if it's chosen to be explicitly greater than 1, then it'll, this, this, the result here will be something slightly negative. So we'll end up with proving that t of n is c n minus b minus some small term. And if t of n is less than or equal to this expression minus this expression, then it's clearly less than or equal to this expression on its own. So this is why subtracting a lower order term makes sense because when we subtract a lower order term in the overall claim, that lower order term will get subtracted twice on the right hand side here, giving us a better chance to prove what the original claim was. On the other hand, if we had added a lower order term, then we would have got something even larger than what we wanted to prove. That wouldn't have helped us, which is why we subtracted a lower order term. Now we've proven the induction step here directly, but we obviously need to prove the base case as well for the induction proof to be complete. So let's try to prove the base cases for our modified claim. Let's try to prove that this claim holds for n equal to 1. 
which would be good enough because n greater than or equal to 2 uh, the values of n greater than or equal to 2 are covered in our induction step so let's try to prove that this claim holds at n equal to 1 so what is t of 1 t of 1 is given to be equal to 1 so the left hand side here is 1 the right hand side here at 1 will be c times 1 minus b which is simply c minus b so when will this claim be true when will 1 be less than or equal to c minus b this will be true if c is greater than or equal to b plus 1 now remember that both b and c are positive constants so if this is our number line and let's say this is 0 the constraint we need to satisfy here is that the value of the positive constant c needs to be at least one larger than the value of the positive constant v. So if this is where b lies on the number line, then c must lie at a distance of at least one to the right of b. So this is the constraint that we get from the base case. Now we don't really need to prove the base case uh, we don't really need to include n equal to 2 as a base case, but let's say we let's say we do that as well. Can we prove that this claim holds at n equal to 2? Well, the left hand side here will be t of 2, which is again 3. We calculated this uh, a few minutes ago using the recurrence. The right hand side here is 2 times c minus b. So the constraint we get for n equal to 2 is that twice of c needs to be greater than or equal to b plus 3 or c needs to be greater than or equal to b plus 3 divided by 2. So again, I mean this, this uh, is not really necessary to prove but let's say we have these two constraints for argument's sake. From the induction step, we got one additional constraint that the value of b needs to be greater than or equal to 1. So if we are able to satisfy all three of these constraints, we would have proven that there do exist positive constants b and c such that for all values of n larger than or equal to 1, t of n is less than or equal to c times n minus b. We would have proven this modified claim. So let's choose a value of 1 for b because if you want to satisfy the third constraint which we got from the induction step b needs to be greater than or equal to 1 so let's say we choose b to be equal to 1 we will need to choose a value of c at least greater than or equal to 2 so that this constraint is satisfied so c needs to be greater than or equal to 2 so let's say we choose c to be uh, say 3 Let's now check whether this other constraint is also satisfied. Is 3 greater than or equal to 1 plus 3 by 2? Well, yes, it is because 1 plus 3 by 2 is 4 by 2, which is 2. So this third constraint is already satisfied if we choose b equal to 1 and c equal to 3. So we have found values for these positive constants b and c such that for all values of n greater than or equal to 1, e of n is less than or equal to c times n minus b. Now if t of n is bounded from above by c times n minus b, if t of n is bounded from above by c times n minus b, is t of n in big O of n? Yes, it is. Because c n minus b is a linear expression in n and any linear expression in n is going to be in big O of n. In fact, it's going to be in theta of n. So we have proven that t of n is big O of n. We have proven the first part of what we wanted to prove. We, we ultimately want to prove that t of n is in theta of n because that was our guess, our original guess. We first focused on proving the upper bound, that is t of n is in big O of n and we have 
ended up proving this first part, the upper bound on T of 